Sweden uh, and abroad, um, Circa has used the humanities or uh, with the humanities has a platform, uh, indeed now a global platform, to speak about the concept of the planetary humanities, which I know he's going to say more about today, and then to uh, simultaneously uh, address the question of the Arctic humanities. And as I understand it, in what sense we might be persuaded to think of the humanities as a response uh, to a situation of crisis. So on that note, uh, I welcome you, Sverka, and uh, pass the, uh, the, the podium over to you to begin your talk. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Michael and Adrian as well for uh, inviting me to this, uh, to this room, to this forum. Uh, and um, I, I thank you also, Marco, for the introductory words. Um, in the time that is left after those words, I will speak for a while. And, and um, um, I would like to also say that we have arranged it the way that I will show some slides and they will be operated by, by uh, Michael from where he sits uh, in England. I'm in Stockholm. Uh, so it's, it's great to be uh, around this place today, this conversation around a topic that I find very important, um, uh, not just for the Arctic, but for the entire world just now. And this topic is the role of humanities knowledge for the Arctic, as we heard. And for many, this was a fairly strange idea to talk about humanities in the Arctic until quite recently. And this is the moment to tell you a, a bit of a personal story. Being born and bred in Lapland in Sweden, what is now actually talked about as the Swedish Arctic, a term we never used, of course, when I grew up. I couldn't, of course, uh, ever say that I went to the Arctic when I just went home until my very first time actually in 1997 when I was invited by the Swedish Polar Research Authority to join a group of maybe 15 scholars from the humanities, most Swedes, but some from other countries as well. And we were invited for a week long visit to the Arctic, namely the real Arctic. And this trip took us to Svalbard. Now the purpose was to familiarize scholars who had already developed an interest in the North with fieldwork and logistics, uh, and to build a program for humanities research in the Arctic. We were historians, archeologists, anthropologists, a philosopher, I can remember, an art historian, and so on. And I can say that what did really grow as a consequence of this largely discipline-based uh, approach to the Arctic was more of the same in a sense. Uh, some more disciplinary work basically, but more work also. Some disciplines that had been not so present in the first place remained for fairly marginal, I think. And those who had a distinct traditional research object with an established Arctic prefix, like for example, Arctic anthropology, Arctic archeology, span or for that matter, Inuit or Sami studies, they were the most and they remained the most active Scholars in other fields, like for example, film, literature, art, media, did not come along easily just because the agency could offer a ship or some equipment to go to the field now and then. They sometimes even asked, what's the point of going to the field? This has now changed in a bit more than 20 years and it has changed considerably and the change is ongoing. And I'm confident that this is a process that we should engage in and to use that word curate. I think we're in a moment where we need to curate what the progress that we are making. Uh, and um, much has happened during, uh, I would say particularly the international polar year from 2007 to 2009. And here's another moment for more personal. I was president of the Swedish national committee for the polar year. And it was in and of itself a signal of this change since of course, during all previous polar years, my predecessors had been natural scientists, first rate ones, I should say too. Uh, I had a 20 member committee, which was interdisciplinary and with an almost 50-50 gender balance uh, back then. And also I think something unheard of in past polar years. 
as Igor Krupnik uh, at the Smithsonian and others have made clear in, in several studies of the epistemic demography and the science politics of IPY, something really did happen in that moment. Something integrative, bringing educationists together with artists, humanists with scientists, field scientists with archive-based work, etc. Numbers also grew and diversity grew tremendously, spurred by new funding schemes and also I think of changes in geopolitics. This was for example right after the Stern report on the economics of climate change. Uh, and in 2007 there was a new Arctic sea, low, sea ice low uh, beyond any modeled expectation. Some of you may remember that. The news broke uh, during a European Science Foundation Arctic conference I was in uh, and it really sent shockwaves through that meeting. Uh, one of the talks in the conference was given by Kirsten Hastrup, uh, an early advocate of broad approaches to Arctic anthropology, and she should be showing up on the screen, I think, now, um, if things work as they should. Uh, Michael, I hope you can move to the next slide, if you can. Um, there she is. Um, a year later, uh, the financial crisis made the world tremble, really, and disclosed the profound hypocrisy, how the ice was melting precisely because of the silly economics. And then COP15 in Copenhagen and the renewed failure to organize the world for progress. Uh, while news constantly dropped in of the fossil and mining hype in the Arctic and how it would bring a new era, bring a new era of industrial growth into the region. So this was all happening around us as this uh, polar year went on. We said before and during the IPY that what was the most important thing for the humanities and social sciences this time was to uh, abandon the Arctic knowledge exceptionalism, uh, and with that I mean the hegemony of science, and allow for a more pluralistic knowledge base, and also with a more indigenous presence. So we had these ideas, and we talked a lot about them. We tried to do the best we could with that, but we had not been bold enough to envision the dramatic shifts that would happen within the humanities themselves over precisely the same years between around 2005 and 2010 that ushered in a new way of conceiving an engaged and challenge-oriented humanities, which of course happened many other places, not just in the Arctic. I will have to leave some details aside here, but just so that you know, around 2010, even slightly before, the environmental humanities started to form under that uh, name. And my own first email conversation with the Swedish Foundation uh, about setting up a program in that field is from 2007. <laughs> it's already a while ago, actually. And then I, I remember calling it ecological humanities. And similar ideas floated around in other places as well, not least in Australia, where they also started the International Journal of the Environmental Humanities in 2012, which is now taken over by Duke University Press. Uh, we also organized in Stockholm, or a place just outside Stockholm in 2011, uh, an international workshop on the environmental humanities. So these things happened in parallel, I think, importantly. First, the new integrative visionary thinking of the IPY moment and the attempts to carve out an expansive new agenda for humanities research. And second, the environmental turn of the human sciences which was also the theme, I should say, for my own year at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study in 2013-14, which can be seen uh, uh, as a sign of, of the prominence of the new thinking uh, of, of that uh, field. Uh, I was there that year, a great year, and uh, let me show you this uh, slide just to tell you how fast things have moved. I worked quite a bit that year with my co-member of the Institute, Joe Masco, a Chicago-based anthropologist. We co-hosted a seminar for which we proclaimed that there are no planetary humanities. As you can see, I even have the manuscript kept in my drawer. I would argue that this was also true in a sense in October 2013, but only a few years later, it was very untrue. 
the concept started to pop up all over the place. Uh, and I found to my surprise that I used it myself uh, in, in this particular contribution to a new handbook of the environmental humanities published in 2017. And in the utmost of times then, and you can take a look at the next uh, slide as well, there was a meeting in 2018 uh, in somewhere in Asia, I think in China. Uh, so you, you find these things popping up in, in the last few years. And in the utmost of times in 2019, Dipesh Chakrabarti, who was the convener of the uh, thematic year at the Institute in Princeton, uh, although he never showed up actually, that was a, a particular story. Uh, he published an article in, in Critical Inquiry entitled precisely, The Planet, an Emergent Humanities Category. So I think by now there is something called the planetary humanities. Uh, and with me, um, uh, personally, in a sense, similar internal landslides also happened. In 2015, I published two papers with, with a couple of conceptual innovations. One was precisely the Arctic humanities. Uh, uh, and um, you could say, actually, that the different strands had now started to come together, almost like tributaries to a river. Uh, and it seemed obvious when it happened but it was just strange that I had not heard it from somebody else before. Uh, so that was Arctic Humanities. The other concept was cryohistory uh, that I drew from cryosphere, of course, a word I love to explicate whenever I have a chance. Very fascinating concept with a fascinating history. I cannot speak to all these images here, but the founder of the concept, uh, Antony Dobrowalski, back in the early 1920s is there with a beard uh, in the middle of the picture. Uh, I'd used that word since 2011 in talks. Now I thought I should use it in print, and that was again 2015. And during a period at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in the winter and spring of 2016, I co-authored an article with a geographer there by the name of Graham Wynne, where we launched the concept integrated humanities to signal that there is a commonality to the pretty wide range of prefix humanities, namely that they take on issues rather than follow disciplinary traditions. And this means uh, they, I think, build collaboration into their DNA. Uh, the integrative humanities take on more pragmatic views on methodologies. They tend to engage more in the real world challenges and wish to pursue a knowledge pro project that can change things if you put it that way. Uh, I think they heed to Andy Sterling's research policy concept also from around 2010, which is directionality. Uh, economic growth, for example, often a cherished outcome of research isn't enough. It's also how wealth is distributed and what happens to the earth and to people and cultures when wealth is growing. And that is how we get a following, I think, in digital humanities, energy humanities, climate humanities, and prominently environmental humanities. And in the Arctic humanities, scholars remain something in some discipline to get their PhD, to maintain positions that are still largely based in disciplines, but their practice shifts to issue mode, if I may put it that way. And I think also to more pluralistic criteria of success. So why is all this going on? And why is it important? Why should we pursue it? Um, first of all, I'd like to see this ongoing change as part of a wider change in what I call research and innovation policy regimes. And we can identify uh, several broad regimes that have steered at least the mainstream Western science and innovation enterprise after, say, 1945. Uh, I won't talk you through this image, but you see clearly the sort of the, the basic structure. It shouldn't be too much of a surprise to you. If this scheme is reasonably adequate, we should already be well into a new and dynamic phase of knowledge development. Um, and I refer here to the uh, last uh, section here called the super complexity uh, regime. Uh, that's a term I've borrowed from, uh, uh, from, a, from a scholar by the name of Barnett. 
uh, educationist. Uh, now, if this is reasonably adequate, we should well be well into that period, uh, a new phase of knowledge development, somewhat along the lines I just uh, alluded to here. And I consider this a progressive path and one that we should embrace and pursue further. The ultimate reason is that it serves the needs of a better human earth relationship and that it makes priorities that speak to the deep crisis that we currently face. And one of these crises is about human and indigenous rights and about racism and justice. Um, in the past five years, uh, I've led a research center, center of excellence called REXAC on research extraction and sustainable communities in the Arctic. Uh, we had at the outset the idea that we could carve out uh, what we call the best practice, best practice for policy on these complex issues. But now after five years of work, I think at least I've seen the limitations of this idea. Um, instead, I think it's an unavoidable to think about this as a matter of rights rather than best practice. Of course, methods of extraction can be improved and of course, environmental protection can be advanced. Villages could be better planned. Compensation schemes can be more generous and so on. But what is at play here is also a power game. It is predicated on laws and regulations that have grown in an epoch which has privileged industrial extraction over almost any other dimension of governance or stewardship or management or whatever you wish, wish to call it. Uh, this took 300 years to, to build um, these schemes and required generations of the best minds the world have seen to hammer out the principles of our current societies along with the legal structures. But some of those schemes now produce the wrong outcomes. They protect harmful deeds. They should be questioned in more fundamental ways, I think. And this requires new generations of the finest minds we can get. And they need to go back and redefine the principles according to which we extract resources. We also need to redefine what is progress, uh, a word heard too rarely these days, as does Amartya Sen, the Nobel economist and his followers in this great initiative that has been going on for a few years and um, is still ongoing. A few weeks ago, we were a few scientists, legal scholars and environmental activists that published an op-ed article in Sweden demanding a ban on the extraction of fossil fuels with 15 years as the end date. That's of course a bit utopian, but it was utopian in 1850 to ask the slave owners to free their slaves too. And now their statues uh, lie on the ground since uh, weeks and months ago. The Arctic humanities uh, could and should raise these kinds of issues, I think, and, and think far more widely about progress and prospects. Uh, history tells us we are never bold enough, actually. Change will happen, governments will go away, new social orders can do things differently. And what's the point of research if it doesn't assist us in the search for a better world, if you like? For this way of thinking, you require the kinds of knowledge that humanities possess in rich quantity, but use too rarely. You can go from crisis to crisis and find a similar agenda. The climate crisis is a case in point. I'm just now editing a book entitled Ice Humanities with geographer Klaus Dodds, also an expert on polar geopolitics. And it's absolutely fascinating to see the growth of ice humanities worldwide. Many chapters in this forthcoming book are about the Arctic or aspects of it. If you go back again just to 1997, the year of my Svalbard humanities cruise, <laughs> we had almost none of this. History of glaciology, for example, was mostly a science history. Important groundwork. I did that kind of work myself. Uh, but now we have this fabulous complex uh, analysis where the knowledge of ice is wide range from glaciology, as we see here, my uh, friend geographer Ninis Rusquist, uh, and um, 
Uh, we can see the next slide as well to indigenous knowledge. Uh, this was how it was uh, to work, uh, do field work in collaboration with the Sami in, in the north of Sweden in the, in the 1940s. Uh, when the Tarfala research station was built. And in the next slide, we can also see how uh, domestic work was absolutely necessary to, to keep, the, uh, keep the work going on the ground. Uh, and this is also glaciology. Somebody called it a couple of years ago, feminist glaciology. And of course, to the outrage of many people, but I think this is very, very wise. It's actually uh, a way of expanding our knowledge. It's also a knowledge that tells us a new story of how the earth has been conceived as an environmental object when ice was no longer just a volume uh, that was shrinking or growing or an area that you could measure, but became temporal positions with the ice cores that could travel globally. And um, Here's an example. They could travel from the Greenland ice sheet to the oceans and the tropics. Um, they could inform uh, knowledge about geophysical conditions uh, in, uh, in the, on the rest of the earth. The Arctic humanities is thus also an elemental humanities that is changing the understanding of knowledge and politics and technologies and can bring a lot to bear as we build a new narrative about the human earth relationship. And why is that important? Because without such a narrative, we would lack a storyline for the great transformation that we are also beginning as we speak. Uh, we're at a turning point, I think. We provide key dimensions of the knowledge that this narrative requires especially the kind of knowledge that connect the dots and bring the wider patterns. 10 years ago, working uh, a lot uh, with earth system scientists and co-authoring papers with them, for example, papers about planetary boundaries that you may have heard about. Uh, in Nature 2009 is one of those papers. Uh, I started saying that these scientists were the new synchronizers of the world and uh, that brought various timescales together and provided new directional narratives. But with, in the decade that's passed, with the growth of the integrated humanities, I think we are no longer lagging behind the scientists. Uh, the sciences provide global numbers, often alarming, often illuminating, mind-boggling. But the humanities can add very important things here they can contextualize these numbers. Uh, we can think about relations between instruments, satellite images as they've been composed, the institutions that do the work, uh, the media that convey them, the curves and what is behind them. And we can also imagine alternatives. My colleague, Dutch historian, Johan Schott, was awarded the Schott Prize for the History of, Sci uh, of Technology Society in the United States a few years ago. And I heard his thank you speech for that. He's uh, uh, on the left uh, on this screen. Uh, he, uh, his, his speech was about precisely this property of the humanities, in his case, history. He talked about the historical imagination. Imagination is necessary. It is not just finding out what is the case, what is the case that is important. You need to be able to imagine future worlds just as you must imagine as an historian past worlds. You can't be there, you can't go there. You need to imagine it and the same thing with, with, with future. So I think this is ultimately a topic about a, what I may call a matter of responsibility. If the world in the past invented research agendas that were about military capabilities and one-dimensional uh, economic growth, we now need a knowledge regime that is geared toward dealing with major problems and staying with the trouble, as Donna Haraway suggested. Taking this responsibility in the humanities means to open ourselves to a negotiation between our maybe primary scholarly instincts that sometimes are quite narrow, if not even nerdy, if there is such a word, 
Uh, and, and on the other hand, our collaborative ambitions and efforts that have the potential to impact more broadly. And, and I think negotiate is the good word here. Uh, it's, it's about bo having both. If I were to envision a future Arctic humanities, uh, and to close on that note, it would probably be a pretty mixed, rich ecosystem. I, I would try to build comprehensive, large interdisciplinary initiatives that would entertain sustainable funding over many years, perhaps even on the decadal scale. And within them, I would make sure there were also solo players or mavericks pursuing their odd ideas. But the main focus would be to put the humanities to action. I would make sure that there are people on board that can work for change in the real world and take on that work at the same time. And I would make the effort speak to multiple criteria of success and of research quality. And I would acknowledge, as we have done in a recent article in the journal Minerva just this year, that research quality is a concept with many dimensions. Different communities have their different criteria and they are legitimate. And actually, uh, we tried this out in this um, center of excellence I mentioned in Rexac, and I think it worked pretty, pretty nicely. This, this aspect of Rexac work, worked fine. Uh, the, the best practice idea didn't work so well. And this would, of course, rest on a bottom layer of disciplinary activities in, in multiple places, uh, so to speak, business as usual. Uh, I would encourage the research also, finally, to be less Arctic exclusive. The whole point, I think, is to see the Arctic as part of the world. A polar scholar is, for me, almost a, an anomaly. We must train new and broad cohorts of Arctic experience, but if they cannot publish their findings outside the Arctic publication corridors, it would not be of much use, I think. So uh, on that note, I'd like to uh, run off my, uh, my introductory words here. Uh, thank you very much for the attention.